ABC 10 News at 5 starts right now. First responders now talking about the chaos that unfolded along San Diego's coast when a human smuggling boat capsized. At least three people died. The dangerous conditions they braved to rescue the others who were on board. Plus, Scripps Health targeted by a major cyber attack. We're going to go in depth and explain why these types of breaches are becoming more destructive. And why experts now believe reaching herd immunity with COVID-19 is unlikely. ABC 10 News starts now with breaking news. We have breaking news out of Carlsbad where police are investigating a bomb threat. Sky 10 is over the scene at Omni La Costa Resort and Spa. And this is on Costa Del Mar Road east of El Camino Real. Police are asking the public to avoid that area after they received a suspicious phone call prompting a bomb threat investigation. There is no word yet if authorities have located any threats. We'll bring you some more information as soon as it becomes available. In other news tonight, a major cyber attack targeting Scripps Health over the weekend is continuing to disrupt patient access and care. This evening, the website is still down. Experts say these types of security breaches are becoming more widespread. And our Team 10 investigator, Melissa Masiha, takes an in-depth look. A cyber attack targeting Scripps Health. A statement from the healthcare system said Scripps experienced an information technology security incident late Saturday. Their information technology applications are offline. Scripps confirmed some patients appointments are being affected. Team 10 also learned the attack affected their trauma units. Patients had to be diverted to other hospitals over the weekend. UC San Diego was one of them. So this is a nightmare scenario for any hospital or health system. So we offered to help in any way we could. Dr. Longhurst said the hospital in Hillcrest took in patients that otherwise may have gone to Scripps. When it comes to the hospital system, does it work like mutual aid, like first responders? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, sometimes the public sees us as competitive, but honestly, we all went into healthcare to take great care of patients. Scripps has not said what kind of cyber attack this was, but cybersecurity expert Mike Hamilton said these types of breaches are not going anywhere. The, the most prevalent and pernicious um, threat right now uh, is this thing called ransomware, right, which is extortion. Right now, the average payout is something like $300,000. The top extortion demand right now is $50 million. While we don't always know who is behind these attacks, he said some use the resources of foreign governments. With the pandemic, some criminals had a new focus. It's, it's not just for the purpose of stealing the secrets. It's also for the purpose of disrupting vaccine distribution in other countries. So the entire supply chain is under attack, including companies that produce refrigeration equipment for these vaccines. The Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights keeps records of public health information data breaches affecting at least 500 people. It shows a breach somewhere in the U.S. practically daily. In California, more than 20 cases are under investigation from just this year. We have to spend more of our resources, money, time and people investing in hardening our cybersecurity infrastructure. It's absolutely necessary, but of course we wish that we could spend those dollars in other ways on direct patient care, for example. Melissa Masiha, Team 10. And now some patients appointments are being rescheduled because of this attack. Scripps released an updated statement just this afternoon saying that they are, quote, working tirelessly to resolve issues related to the cyber attack. The FDA is now expected to authorize the Pfizer vaccine for children as young as 12. That expansion could get the U.S. closer to herd immunity that has been talked about since vaccines first became available. But now experts are saying based on those latest trends, we may never reach that goal. We spoke to a local doctor about what that means going forward. Herd immunity, we hear it a lot these days. Simply put, it happens when a large number of the population becomes immune to a disease. And there's a level at which we think that there's not enough people left for the virus to infect, and therefore the epidemic will be extinguished, essentially. Dr. Christian Ramers with Family Health Centers of San Diego says that level for COVID is around 75 to 80 percent of the population. Here in San Diego and all over the country, we're nowhere close to that. We talk about 3.3 million people in San Diego County. We're at 32% fully vaccinated. So that's not even close to what we think of as a herd immunity of 75%. Daily vaccination rates are slowing down. That hesitancy is one of the reasons medical experts say we likely won't reach herd immunity. 
Dr. Raymer says the majority of COVID cases he sees now are in those who haven't been vaccinated. That's just the reality that if you choose not to be vaccinated, then you're basically putting yourself at risk of being one of those very few people that do get this infection going forward. He says that by vaccinating the elderly and higher risk people first, we've seen hospitalizations decrease and overall case numbers go down. He says things could improve even more as vaccines are approved for use in kids. Bottom line, the more people vaccinated, the better, even if we don't reach that magic number. It's not like you reach 75 percent and some switch goes off and then things stop. We've already seen the benefits of a high level of vaccination. And Dr. Ramers couldn't say at this point whether he thinks we'll have to get yearly COVID vaccines. So far, studies show that immunity lasting at least six to nine months. That call definitely encompassed a, like what, what we're here to do. Heroes are emerging one day after a boat with more than 30 people on board crashed into San Diego's coast and capsized as rocks ripped it apart. At least three people died in yesterday morning's accident. Border officials say it is the latest smuggling attempt involving migrants trying to cross into the U.S. More on that in just a moment, but first, let's begin with our ABC 10 News reporter Leah Pizzetti. She's joining us with more on some of the first responders who helped save some of the people from that wreckage. Leah. Yeah, this rocky beach below me is where that boat hit, and it's also where coast, the Coast Guard spent uh, all night searching for any more survivors. That search got called off this morning. It's also where people were spending a Sunday morning. When they saw it happen, they jumped in to help as first responders rushed to the scene. Nothing too out of the ordinary of, you know, responses that we do. Um, go to down there. Lifeguard Bruce Jamison says they first got a call about one person stuck on a boat off of Point Loma. So when he arrived with just two others, they couldn't believe what they were seeing. It was kind of like disbelief and shock just because the initial report was wasn't anything of the actual scene. A boat carrying 32 people trying to get into the country crashed up onto the rocky shore and was quickly destroyed, leaving three dead. You know, you had people with you know, minor injuries all the way to uh, non-breathing, performing rescue breaths on people. He says their training instantly kicked in and they got to work, helping the survivors however they could. We train so much that we want to get on scene and it's just automatic. It's not even something worth really thinking about that it's just... It's just kind of second nature to us. Now, some wreckage still remains. Jameson says he won't forget this day and also wants to thank the strangers who just happened to be on the beach and quickly jumped in to help before first responders arrived. Definitely, you know, give thanks for a lot of the bystanders that were there, you know, putting just people in that situation and for them to respond the way they did, you know, I think that's the other positive side of that call. Unity that may have saved lives. Now, the Mexican consulate says a majority of those survivors are from Mexico. They do range in age from 18 years old to 40. Border Patrol officials tell us they likely will be processed and then removed from the country. We are waiting to hear back on any potential charges for the operator of that boat. Reporting live from Cabrillo National Monument, Leah Pacetti, ABC 10 News. Thank you, Leah. The southern border has seen a surge in migrants seeking asylum already this year. Humanitarian groups say shelters in Tijuana are beyond capacity as many families wait to try and enter the U.S. ABC 10 News reporter Rena Nakano spoke to an immigration lawyer about the recent changes in policy and its impact across the border. For dozens of these undocumented migrants, desperation led to the worst case scenario. When the decision seems to you like a matter of life or death, you try anything you can to survive. That includes jumping on a boat that is supposed to hold six people, 20 at a time, and you hope and you pray you make it across. For the last few weeks, Border Angels Director Dulce Garcia has been in Tijuana giving legal counsel to migrants stuck in Mexico. Since the Biden administration ended the Migrant Protection Protocol or Return to Mexico program in February, Garcia says she's seen a few thousand people get released into the U.S., but it's those without open MPP cases or those subject to Title 42 who are expelled back to Mexico 
Mexico to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in holding facilities that are left on the streets of Tijuana. So they don't know what to do. They arrive at the border asking for asylum. They get rejected at the port of entry and they have nothing left except to cross in these ways that are very tragic. Because of this, Garcia says Tijuana is inundated with homeless migrants, gangs preying on desperation, and coyotes trying to make extra cash. The Biden administration was supposed to end Title 42 months ago, but has extended the Trump era legislation citing public health concerns. Garcia and her organization are pleading to the administration to include asylum as an essential travel. If not, she fears more tragedies like this happening every day. Is there hope for the people who are still in Tijuana right now? That's all they have. Some of them have literally nothing. Don't know where their next meal is going to come from. So that's all they have. It's hope. Rena Nakano, ABC 10 News. County Supervisor Tara Lawson Reamer is looking to get rid of the backlog in immigration courts while saving taxpayers money. Last week, she proposed the creation of a legal defense program for immigrants. It would provide free legal counsel to immigrants detained in San Diego County awaiting trial. Lawson Reamer says trials typically last 18 months but are sped up with legal help. We want to get rid of the backlog in our immigration courts, make sure people have um, a hearing in a fair and reasonable time frame, and that the taxpayers aren't paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars every single day to keep people locked up. The program will start as a $5 million year-long pilot. If it goes well, it could become a permanent partnership with the county and nonprofits. Meantime, it appears more refugees are going to be admitted into the U.S. This afternoon, the White House confirmed the Biden administration will raise the refugee cap to 62,500 people this fiscal year. Last month, the administration abruptly reversed course when it announced Biden would keep this year's cap at 15,000, but not raise it as he had committed to doing. The move faced immediate blowback from refugee groups and Democratic lawmakers frustrated by the sudden shift. Some of San Diego's worst streets could soon get a little love. Today, Mayor Todd Gloria introduced a new proposal called the Sexy Streets Program. It would use $40 million to repair roads in underserved communities like in Canto, San Ysidro and City Heights. We spoke with one resident from Alta Heights who says she's been fighting for this for years. She says it is important to keep up the streets for events like the Filipino American Arts and Cultural Festival. We just definitely have a lot to offer, but it's so difficult to make sure that these events that we put on are safe if our streets are looking like this. And the San Diego City Council will vote on that proposal in June. We have a 10 News follow up now on the fight to keep San Pascual Academy in Escondido open and running. Today, Supervisor Jim Desmond tweeted an extension was granted for the school through June of 2022. That means all seniors and juniors will be able to graduate there. The academy is believed to be the first live in educational center for foster youth in the count in the county, in the country that is. Advocates have been fighting to keep it open after the state announced plans to close it by this October.